Hello, everyone. Um, good, I guess, afternoon to all of you uh, from Brussels um, in this in this virtual and, and digital format. I want to welcome uh, everyone back to the uh, BSIS uh, uh, guest lecture and book talk series. Um, this semester, we uh, kick our uh, uh, book talk series off uh, with an exceptional uh, uh, guest, um, uh, Dr. Nivi Manchanda, from um, well, who's joining us today for uh, 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 for a talk uh, and, and 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 presenting her book, um, imagining uh, Afghanistan: the Heres the history and politics of imperial knowledge. She's joining us from uh, Queen Mary University of. Uh, London. Um, and one thing I forgot to say, uh, my name is Boyan Savic and I'm a lecturer in uh, international relations at the Brussels School of International Studies, University of, of Kent. Uh, um, Nibi is a senior lecturer in international relations uh, at, uh, at Queen Mary and um, uh, we're so, so honored to have you uh, uh, with us uh, today, Nibi. Uh, welcome to BSIS. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thanks to Maria for inviting me and Boyan for being my discussant and also for Tanya to, for setting up this event. Um, I'll jump straight into it. So Imagining Afghanistan is loosely based on my doctoral research uh, and in, therefore it's been a very long project. At the time I was interested in the war on terror and the US empire just like every other disillusioned graduate student but when it came to writing my PhD proposal I was struck by the relative neglect that Afghanistan had been subject to both in academic and popular discourse, especially compared to Iraq, even though this was the longer war. I suppose this became the starting puzzle for me. Why was the war in or on Afghanistan obscured and Afghanistan considered only ever a peripheral subject of inquiry? This has to do with at least according to me, with Afghanistan's limit, liminal space in both what I call imperial discourse and in practice. Afghanistan in some ways is both archetypal and also the exception that proves the rule. We always focus on India or Algeria or the Congo to tell a story about colonialism, but colonization was a vast and sometimes not properly institutionalized endeavor. This is what I call Afghanistan's quasi-colonial status that helps illuminate this. Its locations on the margins of empire makes it distinctive, but also te adds texture to the story of colonialism. The book examines the Anglophone imperial representations of Afghanistan, and there are two main time periods that it focuses on. The 19th century and the early 20th centuries, and then the multiple British colonial incursions into Afghanistan during this period, so this is the first, and then the 21st century after the American-led NATO intervention, which constitutes the bulk of the book. My overarching impetus in the book is to tease out and unpack the racialized and taken for granted nature of colonial knowledge, which disguises itself as the only or the right way of knowing. Afghanistan is fascinating because it is a strange place. It was never properly colonized the way India was, for instance, but it was subject to some pretty invasive restructuring by the British and then Russia and finally by the United States. And yet it remains shrouded in mystery. Narratives of the great game where Afghanistan is looked upon as a pawn between two meaningful entities, Russia and British India, or when Afghanistan is depicted um, as the graveyard of empires, a place where imperial ambition is obliterated almost by default, without much engagement with the history of the region. This brings me to the two main objectives in the book, and I'm going to paraphrase the introduction here. The first is to address what I see or what I saw when I was writing the book as a conceptual lacuna in international relations theorizing, that there remained a tendency to essentialize, even in constructivist and critical work, the other or the third world or the global south or whichever problematic term we choose to use. And the second was to look at, the, at a place that has always been considered marginal and to try and make the claim that what we say about this place, that is Afghanistan, actually says more about us and the processes of knowledge production in the West and specifically in the Anglophone Academy and policymaking than it does about Afghanistan. The book is methodologically eclectic. I look at British colonial archives, 
academic research, policy documents, media and film portrayals to present, present colonial visions of Afghanistan. These are by no means monolithic. Indeed, competing and contradictory representations help spotlight the anxieties that undergird, albeit subliminally, the political economy of colonial knowledge production. Colonial anxiety is a key theme in the book, the desire to capture Afghanistan, but never devote the re resources necessary to this enterprise, has resulted in an overdetermination of the country. There are a lot of very categorical claims made about Afghanistan that go largely unchallenged or unproblematized. Each of the chapters is devoted to one or two of these claims that become capstones in the Im imperial imaginary. Two of the chapters look at gender, which is key to the book, but also to Western intervention in the Middle East specifically and the developing world more generally. Much of the NATO-led intervention that was legitimized to the public through the discourse of saving Afghan women, uh, in Afghanistan, women were considered brutalized in burqas and they needed us. It was a moral duty to help these hapless women. As many scholars have written, including Gayatri Spivak, Leela Abulagod, Chandra Mohanty, to name a few, the brown or the Muslim or the third world woman is always victimized and presented as the white man's burden in diverse and quite intriguing ways. My intention in the chapter on women is not at all to say that there's no female oppression in Afghanistan, but rather that one, there is a tendency to posit the Western liberal woman as not only the norm, but also the apogee of the liberated woman, and two, that the voices of female revolutionary movements on the ground are drowned on the ground are drowned out in favor of American NGOs like Feminist Majority. And these don't really have much of a clue about what's going on in Afghanistan and is quite detached from the lived reality of women in Afghanistan. This means that Afghan women are subject to a double whammy of local patriarchy and Western female nationalism, sort of reminiscent of Bell Hooks's argument. The other side to the gender question is the representation of men. And here the discourse gets really intriguing. Afghan men are represented as queer sodomizers. There's a whole narrative about how they perform homosexuality because they're repressed, but that at the same time, they're portrayed as homophobes and wife beaters. The desire to conjure Afghanistan as a place of perversity and teach gender normativity is really strong. I try to tease out the moral imperative in this liberal economy of representation and intervention. And this ties in again with the colonial anxiety, more particularly when it comes to gender norms and rules, which Afghanistan seems to trouble. Another chapter is ded dedicated to the age old trope of Afghans as unruly tribesmen. And this chapter excavates the genealogy of the trope in the colonial archives and shows that, that, has, that it has been repurposed time and again to make either the intervention seem more urgent, we must reform these backwards people, or to show how we must accept their backwardness and work with them in a language they understand. And that certainly isn't the language of modernity. The chapter then goes on to show how patchy our understanding of Afghan social organization is, how much of it is still based on one person, Mount Stuart Elphinstone's account from 1807, and temporality and the denial of covalness, to borrow Johannes Fabian's term, is central to this chapter to show how images of retrograde warriors has been vital to invasion. And the final key trope is that of the failed state, which ties into all the rest of these. Afghanistan's state is construed as a failure, hijacked by terrorists, overrun by corrupt leaders and nasty warlords. Again, this denies our complicity in creating present day Afghanistan and rides roughshod over Afghanistan's complex history to be able to compress it into bullet points for Western comprehension. I'll pick a couple of instances that bookend the text to try and concretize some of what I'm trying to convey. Um, and let me know if the screen isn't visible, but I'll try to show it here. Sorry. So this is the first slide and it's called an Afghan textbook from the Soviet era. As you can see, this is an image of an Afghan textbook from the 1980s. The school book, which uses bullets and Kalashnikovs as counting tools, is one of the items that was prominently on display at the National Army Museum in London in 2014. I'm sorry, uh, Nivi, just a second. I don't think we can see the slides. Um, oh, no. Let me try again. <laughs> I thought I said share screen. Um, 
Yeah, if not, maybe Tanya can put it up uh, on her end. Yeah, it says it's sharing, but I'm... Hmm. Let's try again. Does that work now? Yes. Okay, I'll try again. So this is the slide I was referring to. Thank you. Yeah, so this slide um, shows a textbook. It shows that children are being taught through bullets and Kalashnikovs. Um, and it was housed in London in the National Army Museum from 2013 onwards. The National Army Museum website notes, and I quote, the book dates from the Islamic era 1356, circa 1986, during the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Its warline, warlike content is a stark reminder of the lasting legacy of conflict in modern Afghan society, end quote. The exhibition's curator, Mary O'Hara, elucidates in great detail the many ways in which, I quote again, war is part of the fabric of daily life in Afghanistan. So to preempt hasty judgment, she explains that while using firearms as tools to learn how to count may seem sinister to us in the West, these objects compose the everyday reality of life in Afghanistan. So while these objects are very different from our everyday objects, they are pedestrian objects of everyday life in their society. The textbook, along with other exhibits displayed, may be read as a laudable attempt to bring the military intervention in underway in Afghanistan at the time into popular consciousness of the citizens of a country, the UK, whose army had been embroiled in a long and protracted war over there. What the exhibition fails to mention is how these textbooks came into being. During the 1980s, a USAID-funded project printed millions of textbooks in Peshawar that were distributed to school children across Afghanistan. The textbooks were designed to indoctrinate Afghans against the evils of the Soviet Union and made for immensely powerful propaganda. Specialists from the Afghanistan Center at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, received 51 million US dollars to develop a curriculum which glorified jihad, celebrated martyrdom, and dehumanized foreign invaders. Published in Dari and Pashto, these school, school books taught the alphabet with images of Kalashnikovs counting through guns and bullets, and had elaborate mathematical questions which drew on conflict scenarios for more advanced years. To take one example, and I quote, a Kalashnikov bullet travels at 800 meters per second. How many seconds will it take to, for the bullet to hit the Russian's forehead if he has a Russian in his sight 3,000 meters away? All the US aid funding stopped for the project in 1994, multiple copies of the text remained in circulation in the 1990s and into the 2000s. The Taliban, in another grisly turn, continued using the American-produced textbooks, but in keeping with their fabricated scripture that denounced all pictorial representation of human images, removed the heads of people depicted in the books. So what remained were images of de decapitated bodies carrying Kalashnikovs, poignant pedagogical instruments for eight-year-olds. I think the story of the Afghan textbook is important because it entirely disavows our complicity in creating the very warlike Afghanistan we now study from an ostensible distance. This narrative also points to the politicized nature of knowledge generation. We know from Edward Said that the self is always already implicated in the production of the other. And this leads often unwittingly to the reification and reinforcement of power hierarchies in relation between the West and the South and the East or the South. But equally, the deliberate writing out of our involvement and imposition of misleading narratives is a particularly pernicious and consistent problem when it comes to Afghanistan. And this brings me to artifact two with which I end the book. Um, and here you can see a US textbook for primary school children. It's called the Book of Freedom. So again, just in time for the new school uh, for the new school year in 2014, a publisher based in St. Louis published a, and re-released a series of coloring books for children across the US. Really Big Coloring Books has updated its version of We Shall Never Forget 9-11 to reflect the political climate at the time and the new terrorist threats the world was facing. So this second edition, and now there's a third and a fourth, I think, included the Boston Marathon bombing, Islamic State, and the, the release of the Taliban bombers 
um, in contrast to the first the coloring book which centered on Al Qaeda. Um, so these books are now also in, accompanied by a featured supplement, the terror update on global jihad. The terror update shows a rather vivid picture of a public crucifixion by ISIS, which, to which the caption reads, this is what ISIS wants to bring to the US and its people. What are you going to do when they come for you? It also features this particular image uh, of the Talibani five, the five Taliban detainees who were released in exchange for Sergeant Berdal. And it reads, Obama administration broke the law by freeing five Taliban terrorists. The page goes on to say uh, that back to the battlefield and this textbook um, talks about how, and I quote again, children, the truth is these terrorist acts were done by freedom hating Islamic Muslim extremists. These people hate Amer the American way of life because we are free and our society is free. Really Big Coloring Books has provided copies of this terrorism series to all 50 states in the US and to the White House. The founder of the company, Wayne Bell, declared in a video statement, and I quote again, our books tell the truth, they tell it often, and they tell the children that these books actually explain what's going on today. We're trying to educate the country on these animals, these brutal people, these terrible human beings on the planet called ISIS, these terrorists, end quote. And in an interview with the Daily Based, Bell maintained that the books were instructional and taught positive values and that they were important for people in the US. They don't understand, he said. They don't have pictorials to show people. It's a delicate topic and it needs to be explained in black and white. This is not happening overseas, he continues. It's happening here. Um, and that's why we're making them. My presentation, like the book, opened with an anecdote that captured the ways in which knowledge was produced about Afghanistan, about how it was generated and marketed in the US and repackaged to construct Afghanistan as a war prone nation marked by its, Ill, its failure and always already imprinted by a difference. While the incident regarding the publishing and dissemination of numeracy books for Afghan children can be thought of as an act in a series of willful forgetting and selective omissions, the publishing of coloring books in the US for consumption at home which de demonizes and, and invalidates an entire people by teaching children and the evils of their culture may be thought of as acts of premeditated remembrance and calculated commemoration. The Afghan textbooks on the one hand are deployed as instruments of amnesia and the American ones as mnemonic devices. This selective remembering and forgetting is crucial to the story of Afghanistan and also to pedagogy more generally. I'm going to stop here um, and I'll close my share my stop sharing my screen and um, go back to the yeah uh, I'm yeah so I'll stop here about the book but I'll say a couple of things that I can't help sneaking in that I think I would have liked to explore in more detail or where I think the book might fall short one is that I don't fully explore the implication of capitalism and how specifically racial capitalism in this story functions uh, and is so crucial to the West engagement with Afghanistan. And the second is that sometimes I think I fall into the trap of treating the colonial archives as some sort of repository of truth and knowledge. And I think if I were to do this again, um, I take more inspiration from the works of Sadia Hartman and Stephanie Smallgood to look at the erasures, the silences and the occlusions of the archive and also what the archive doesn't contain or refuses to contain. Um, it says my PowerPoint is still on. Is that true? Sorry, um, and now it's off. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, I'll stop that. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Nivi. Thank you for this um, great introduction to your work um, for um, some of our students and colleagues who are less familiar with it. Um, but also um, into this uh, particularly fascinating, fascinating book and its and its argument. So thank you for that. <clears throat> now um, I, I'll have a few questions for you before I open it up to um, the audience questions. Um, and 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 just just please bear with me. Um, I guess my 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 first question was um, getting at what what the book is about, which is sort of the production of knowledge 
production of representations about Afghanistan. Um, what I'm interested in, you know, is this paradox as in, you know, uh, you have millions of ordinary people around the world who've uh, never spoken to a person who's lived in Afghanistan, who's from Afghanistan. Um, they've never read a book about Afghanistan. Um, they've uh, 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 sort of not even the, the sort of popular literature, right? That, that rehashes these tropes of, uh, oh, you go to Afghanistan to die. It's a grave of empire. It's not even that, right? Who have a very passing knowledge or familiarity uh, with, with the place that mostly comes from sort of uh, news snippets, uh, uh, um, brief articles in print media, uh, and the sort of offhand comments by news anchors, pundits, and commentators. And yet, in spite of this sort of very cursory engagement um, with, with the place and people um, that you talk quite a bit about, in spite of all that, they have very specific and have pushed a very elaborate ideas of where Afghanistan is, uh, what, it, what it looks like, how Afghans look like and live, um, what their daily lives are and what kind of quote unquote people they are and what kind of uh, land Afghanistan is. How do you explain this paradox, right? People <clears throat> who barely engage with the place have very oddly specific ideas about it. And, and could you tell us a little bit <clears throat> based on your engagement with academic writing, with media narratives, what those ideas are? Right? You've talked about some of those already. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think I was also extremely interested uh, in that very paradox that we have loads of talk about Afghanistan in some ways, uh, but actually it's extremely surface based on no real, for instance, field work or like you say, even actually um, engagement with public discourse uh, as in media um, outlets and things like that. So I think one of the things to try to sort of pass that question a little bit um, is a, a function of Orientalism. So we often have very elaborate notions of how Africans live in mud huts, etc. And so there's like a general sort of um, knowledge edifice about the Orient or about uh, the South. So, but I think it is particularly um, accentuated, if you like, or uh, or just greater when it comes to Afghanistan. And I think there's two things there. One is that those kinds of popular notions based, shall we say, on not based on fact, um, is, the, is actually a story of a longer genealogy or lineage of knowledge production of, of, of Afghanistan. So even academic texts written right now uh, are often based on, if not hearsay, based on the work of somebody in who's in Afghanistan in the 19th century. So even in 2018, you could declare that um, the best book ever written about Afghanistan was Mount Stuart Elphinstone's uh, account of the Kingdom of Kabul, as he called it, which was penned in 1807. And it's a pretty mammoth text, but it is based on hearsay. And he likens the Afghans to the, the clan system in Scotland. And so, you know, that if, if academic discourse is building on very, very thin evidentiary base, then you can see how public discourse uh, propagates that and actually is even less in touch with what's happening on the ground. Um, and the second thing I think is that there is, especially after 9-11, but this happens quite a lot in the story of Afghanistan or the story of colonial Afghanistan, is that uh, there's almost an emergency episteme around it. So after 9-11, you needed information on Afghanistan and you needed experts. And so virtually overnight, there was like all these pundits being like, we know about Afghanistan and they know about Afghanistan because they've read Khalid Hosseini or because they've watched Rambo or something fairly, um, well, actually quite dangerous and misleading, uh, but also quite divorced from what's going on. And I think that is very, very pertinent to the kind of story I'm telling. But also, I, I don't want to completely straw man that because there are some very good people working on Afghanistan. You are, I know, but also Martin Bailey and Max Derfall and Ben Hopkins, who've, just, who've done the academic work, the kind of 
shed the myths about Afghanistan. But you're right, on a general sort of public discourse level, there is no deep engagement and it, it remains a bit of a mystery. Um, you know, those are the kind of things I can point towards, but I can't give you like this is definitely the reason Afghanistan is not engaged with, and yet we know it. Thank you. That that is that is super interesting. Um, you so in in trying to account for this paradox, you started off um, uh, by talking about the uh, um, uh, uh, colonial legacies in uh, representation of the sort of non-European spaces. Let me put it that. Uh, in, 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 in such sloppy terms. And you, and you started off by, by pointing to the habits and mannerisms of Orientalism, right? But it, fascinatingly, in the book, you say that um, um, Afghanistan is as much of uh, disorient to the West as it is its Orient. And, 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 and I love that, that recasting of the, the work of Orientalism in, in, in uh, sort of policy, geographic, colonial, anthropological, and, and, and other academic and popular discourses. Can you tell us a little bit about Afghanistan as the disorient? Yeah, thanks. Um, so one of, one of the reasons I call it the disorient was just because it was often portrayed as a land of chaos in the archives, right? And we still have those myths with us, like unruly leaders, wild tribesmen that can't be controlled, that don't know what governance is, and how sometimes how do we work with that, and other times how do we fight it. So there's, so that's the disorient. But the other reason it's specifically disoriented Orientalism and Western sort of historiography is also because it was never properly colonized, right? So there were all these incursions into Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan was thought of as a useful buffer, need, needed to be secured, but it was India that the British mostly put its energies towards. And I, I'm not a, um, a historian of the Soviet Union, but there seemed to be likewise an ebb and flow of imperial knowledge. And it certainly has been the case for after 9-11 and since 2001. So given that there wasn't this sort of solid colonial edifice of knowledge that came with places like India or Algeria, and yet we kind of post-colonial scholars, all, we're all guilty of that, kind of still use the same lenses or the same frameworks to study Afghanistan was the reason it kind of disorients or there is um th there's some weaknesses in that way of studying a place that has a very particular and different historical legacy. Right, right. Thank you. Um, is that uh, um, dis the, the, the place and the dynamic of disorientation can that help explain how uh, another paradox in our quote unquote knowledge and truth about Afghanistan or a paradox in the representation of Afghanistan, which is that somehow Afghanistan can be a failed state, right? So, 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 you know, imagined as a place of failure where things don't work, where, you know, money goes to die uh, uh, because it's just a place like that, right? And at the same time, be a graveyard of empire. Right, where empires, these powerful, destructive, uh, but also civilizational armies just go to be diminished and defeated, right? Is, is that an example of the disorienting effect? Absolutely. I mean, there's always contradictions. And one of the things about colonial anxiety is that they try to paper over those contradictions and um, produce a sort of coherent discursive regime, if you like. But with Afghanistan, those contradictions are so major, and this comes in in the chapter on on men. So men are at once these um, queer, strange men who like other men, but at the same time are all into female oppression and you know things like that. So the the discursive regime has more cracks uh, than other discursive regimes. So you can tell a fairly coherent story about. Uh, post-partition India, for instance. Um, and that that is because of the institutionalization of knowledge, but also because there has been some actual effort gone into studying that place uh, and, and also a sort of interplay between colonial knowledge and knowledge on the ground. Uh, whereas Afghanistan is, uh, it, the engagement is so cursory, so superficial, 
that these contradictions are bound to occur and the way to deal with them is has been so uh, not to not to like try to tease out or unpack those contradictions but to say oh afghanistan is a is a contradictory place it's this land of mystery it's shrouded in things we don't know and we can't explain and you know the people behave stranger or more sort of um weirdly than uh, in other places and that again perpetuates that narrative about afghanistan being like a graveyard of empires because we can't even study it and everybody dies and yet it's very backward so how do we explain the fact that these you know warriors can beat the united states if you like or you know so so yeah that that just keeps compounding itself almost it's like a reinforcing self fulfilling uh, prophecy right it is the it is the maddening and mesmerizing uh, effectiveness of of these disjointed representations to reproduce themselves precisely because they're so confounding right exactly yeah precisely because they cannot be disentangled yeah for a whole host of reasons they they endure but 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 that is a potent sort of force behind it yeah um so you just used the phrase that uh, that i think is very um important to your to your book and to your argument yeah and so i want to i want to try and unpack it a little and 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 bear with me my i'm 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 playing a bit of a devil's advocate here and my question is a little facetious but but uh, i hope you know that in my heart of hearts i i, I just want to set you up uh, uh, you up for the for the, for the good response um so you say that afghanistan is a discursive regime right and for i know for a whole host of my students that is a somewhat um confusing uh, proposition because they would think of afghanistan as an actual place right right with 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 living people with with you know with 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 rivers with mountains with lands as as afghanistan is typically talked about uh with roads with uh, workplaces uh, with borders what is it and how what do you mean by 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 it as by you know by calling it a discursive regime Uh, yeah so um first of all i'm absolutely not saying that afghanistan isn't a real and actual place uh one of the things that i'm trying to say is that i'm interested in the construction of afghanistan as a discursive regime so that's what where what my focus is but also for me as for said or fuko this course isn't something that is divorced from material reality but rather it is an attempt to understand the relationship between say language and social institutions and subjectivity and is crucially a uh, um an enactment of power so who gets to decide what a place is and who gets to to then say this is the place and this is how it's going to be enacted upon or intervened in and i think this western um power knowledge about afghanistan is what i'm referring to as a discursive regime and then i won't try to show how the contours of this discursive regime may be fleshed out but actually the substance isn't all there and that we then paper over the lack of knowledge by just saying this is what we know about afghanistan and therefore it is which is something that you can do only from a position of power and and that yeah solidified sort of um discursive or um representational aspect of afghanistan is what i'm interested in fascinating yes thank you um and 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 thank you for that that uh, tiny mini bitsy lecture on on discourse analysis i i think you you managed to convey some some key points there um uh, by the way uh uh maria uh, um our beloved colleague uh, she teaches an excellent workshop on uh, discourse analysis in our methods class and so anyone listening to this uh, uh uh you you're more than more than welcome to join that um thank you for that um i will now turn to some of the audience questions uh and then uh, I'll, i'll i'll abuse my moderating uh, position uh at some more later on and 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 i'll throw a few more questions at you if that's okay um now uh, as far as the audience questions okay Uh, um we have two questions so far one from Maria and one from Reda let's start with Reda uh, one of our phd students um uh, at bss he says this is a brilliant lecture in ev i have a question i could see a very insightful analysis of the knowledge power relations on the production of afghanistan as disorient in your work what i'm in, what i'm interested in is to ask you is, is whether you have looked at the dynamic uh, or 
of a similar power production of knowledge inside Afghanistan. Say, about the production of the category of the subaltern Shia Hazara by dominant Sunni social actors in Afghanistan. For instance, the Pashtun. This, this also, by the way, comes uh, also from um, uh, Reda's own PhD work, which is about the historical construction, the genealogy of the Sunni Shia divide and why it's so enduring in our imagination of uh, the connected Arab, Middle Eastern, and Muslim worlds. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. And um, I don't actually do that, but I do end the book with precisely something like that. That needs to be the next project. And the imperial discourse can only ever be supplanted if there is a, sim a, a, a sort of discourse on the ground and engagement and especially field work. Uh, and ethnography of Afghanistan. So yes, I, I think that's really important. Um, and if you're doing it, that's a, the great, a great thing. But my, the remit of my project was to look at Western discourse and Western knowledge production. Also, I'm not, you know, I'm not an Afghan expert of the sort of traditional anthropological kind at all. So. Right. Well, well, you do show a lot of expertise, though, in the book. So, <laughs> so, so thank you for that. I, I think, and I thank Rita, Rita for the question because it does add a layer to this discussion that uh, uh, we otherwise, um, you know, missed. Absolutely. Uh, question from Maria. This is fascinating. Thank you, Nivi. Could you tell uh, me us more about your engagement of film uh, in your study of the images and imaginings of Afghanistan? Which films did you investigate? why these over the alternatives and how exactly methodologically? I think this is an excellent question. Um, and I know it comes from uh, uh, some of Maria's and, and my own sort of fascinations with, with sort of the, the plurality of forms in, 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 in the phenomenologies of text and discourse. And uh, so please, yes. Yeah, um, thanks. Again, a really good question. And I did struggle with this because um, I watched quite a lot of film and then didn't know which one would actually make it in Afghanistan. Film is a small part, um, the sort of pictorial discourse is a small part of the representation of Afghanistan for the book. Um, and some of the films that did make it made it because they were so prominent. So, you know, Rambo, and Afghanistan makes it because everybody talks about Afghanistan through it. Um, but methodologically, I suppose, I say that the book is methodologically eclectic, but also I um, drew inspiration from works that weren't necessarily trying to convey the whole picture or try to be methodologically super uh, on point in, in terms of like, um, a, a, like almost quantitative analysis even if you're looking at discourse it was more um uh what mike shapiro has called montage as method where you choose the things that you look at that stand out for you but that actually tell a story and are relevant either because of their import so how many people are looking at that or because uh they mean something at that specific political or historical moment so there's a whole section on methodology where i tried to um, justify my sources, but also to try and make a point about how sometimes the way in which we think me think about method is far too rigid. And epistemologically, method can be far broader, far more diverse, uh, and, and that we should look at unlikely places sometimes and be open to see where the archive leads us. Um, and so, so, yeah, so, you know, there's a film and then there's a India office record from the 1831 uh, entry, for instance, in the same place. And that, that those are not conventional choices, but I defend them to say, this is how the, disc the discourse around Afghanistan can be made more plural and be opened up. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, so while, 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 while people uh, uh, attending the talk are still thinking about their questions, um, let me get back to some um, some of my fascinations with with your with your work. Um, I, I, I perhaps want to go back to the to the to the work of these uh, paradoxes in the construction of Afghanistan. Um, could you and and then drawing on these images through the film, um, could you perhaps try and uh, unpack how was it possible for Americans to forget so quickly 
uh, or to supplant so quickly this um, this heroic uh, 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 image of uh, Afghans that was constructed in the 80s for them and by them. Uh, they were complicit in it, right? Ordinary people, right? Uh, um, and, and sort of the, the image of the, of the valiant viral Afghan uh, 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 man resisting, you know, Soviet oppression and the forces of, of, of the evil empire and yada, yada. And how all of that kind of went out the window uh, after 9-11 and was supplanted with so much ease. It took a few news articles to, to quickly re-trigger this imagination of uh, and, and, and you know some sparse media reporting to 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 retrigger this imagination of Afghanistan of, of oh God you know here's this place you know and now we have to deal with it could you could you tell us a little more about it yeah again really really good question um and you're right there was this in the 80s and into the 90s there was this image of Afghanistan as these heroic warriors Ronald Reagan referred to them as heroes um and in the fight for freedom so it's quite funny how that that notion of freedom also goes from something that Afghanistan's are absolutely embedded in and pro and then all the reason there's not freedom in 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 the world is suddenly because of you know Afghanistan so um and I think again this goes back to the sort of short-termist knowledge production which is um produced knowledge is produced almost in response like a knee-jerk knowledge economy uh is what reigns in Afghanistan and because it has gone over, gone on for so long, there isn't this like sedimented knowledge or this pool to draw on. So these experts, these pundits, they can just say as though there is no institutional or uh, personal memories of Afghanistan being anything other than that. And that's kind of what is so fascinating and it's also so problematic because this is um, a country that has been pretty crucial even geopolitically and yet it's remade and unmade in the image of the colonial powers um, time and again and yes the, the heroic warriors is absolutely that and it also goes back to your earlier question that there is this the contradiction and those contradictions are never fleshed out never engaged with that they are just the contradictions are in the discourse are blamed on the contradictory and mysterious nature of Afghanistan. And that is the whole discursive regime, right? So, yeah. Fascinating. Thank you for, for tying all these various things uh, uh, back back together. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was fascinating always for me to reread those lines that um, by sort of American politicians, including Ronald Reagan in the 80s that describe Afghans, uh, sort of compare Afghans to American founding fathers, right? Exactly, yeah. In terms of their commitment to freedom. freedom, And then to see how quickly that, 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 was, uh, that, that was replaced. Um, um, and, and you touch upon this, and I think this is a related question. You touch upon it throughout the book um, why was it so relatively easy for uh, uh, people uh, um, who really had no substantive engagement with the place to become Afghan experts and pundits uh, almost overnight uh, uh, after 9-11? Yes, yeah, so I think this goes back to the fact that the Brits labeled Afghanistan the stuff in between two meaningful entities. And those entities became well, Soviet Russia and British India at the time, which meant that actually, um, and this is a sort of larger point about Afghanistan not really fitting into any geographical ap appellation. It's not quite Central Asia. It's not quite South Asia. It's not quite the Middle East. And so people from all these different regionals, regions with regional expertise could also just chime in and be like, oh, we know about Afghanistan because we know about Kazakhstan, or we know about China and that borders you know, all we know about India, which was very def definitely sort of the South Asia stuff. And so that because there hasn't been, there's been like, well, there's one study, uh, one center devoted to the study of Afghanistan that I know of in Nebraska. And that, that was funded by the CIA. So because there isn't this, you wouldn't have that in most other places because there wasn't this sort of edifice again and properly sort of institutionalized um place to go and study Afghanistan and even while I was doing my PhD that it didn't fit into any department really um, because Afghanistan does not fit into area studies it seems to be an outlier then those area studies people or 
and, and mostly not academics actually, but mostly policy people and think tanks could then just capitalize on the sort of, oh, the, Afghanistan is on the margins of this and therefore we're experts of it and on it. So yeah, I think that happened loads actually. Yeah, uh, I guess I can contribute with a bit of a, a personal anecdote. I remember when um, I was still sort of working on designing my 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 field work, uh, uh, um, sort of research design for 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 uh, head ups, um, and I was at the same time interviewing for a job um, someplace in, in in America, and uh, and so they wanted someone who who would teach uh, Central Asian studies. Uh, um, and uh, sort of when I was trying to sell myself to this uh, enterprise, uh, I said, well, I do this research on Afghanistan. And, 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 uh, and so quite literally in the interview, um, I, I had one of the panelists say, oh yeah, Afghanistan, right? Um, and, and it was hard for me to think that the person wasn't aware of the country, right? I, I think it's just, just this it, disorientation, right? The disorienting effect, right? That, oh yeah, I guess it, it could fit in, right? Um, and uh, and maybe it was it also came partially from my own uh, um, resistant attitude to to the notion of area studies to begin with as I was trying to sell myself. Uh, but anyways, but but yes, absolutely, it's it's replicated in such micro scales, uh, uh, and this discursive regime works uh, um, even among us, you know, who uh, the, the people that we think of as the enlightened critics of, mm -hmm. of colonial discourses, right? In these awoke places such as the, the, the liberal academia, right? Um, all right, so, so, so let's keep uh, uh, sort of pushing some, some of these questions. Um, I, want to, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, the enduring and unrelenting representation of Afghanistan as a tribal. And so where does that come from? Uh, what does it do historically and politically, um, and uh, what is actually meant by, by that? Yeah, um, great question again. So yeah, in terms of what you just said with your anecdote first, um, yeah, it, Afghanistan is sort of an afterthought, right? When it isn't in the, it, so it's just stacked on, and that again goes on to say something about the colonial episteme um, and the emer emergent and emergency sort of nature of it. Um, in terms of tribal Afghanistan, again, a lot of this has to do with Mount Stuart Elphinstone, who I already mentioned, and the fact that his tomb remains the most studied, most engaged with work on Afghanistan. He um, uh, was, was a missionary and first sent on a mission to India, and then a colonial mission, and then uh, ventured into what he calls the Kingdom of Kabul before Afghanistan sort of borders were properly delineated. Um, and he studied the Afghan people, a lot of it by hearsay, but some by talking to them. And he comes up with the notion that Afghan tribes, and there's some debate about whether we should use the word tribe in and of itself. Um, you could think of it as a form of social organization, but most of anthropology and sociology has moved away from tribal as a descriptor, because it it um, it is so heavily loaded. But if you think about tribe as a sort of mode of political and social organization that is different from a statist one, so you know that's the state and the tribes are uh, sort of more narrow and they might be with a head or might be even more democratic, uh, which is not a word that is normally used with tribal organization, but one can use that. Um, he thought that they were very similar to. Scotland, like I said. So the clan system, the Scotland of clearances was likened to the tribal system in Afghanistan. And then this became the primary way in which Afghan society and political organization was studied. Um, and I also think there's a conflation of all Afghan um, organization and social life uh, with Pashtun the Pashtun people, right? So whether, even though Pashtun people count for maybe 50% or 60%, depending on the statistics of Afghanistan, all of them, all of Afghanistan is thought of as Pashtun. And also when you look at sort of documents that deal with the tribes, they all talk about Pashtun Bali, which is according to them, this almost rarefied way that everybody has this code of honor and everybody follows that. But Pashtun Bali is much more, um, from what I know, much more uh, fluid 
and much, much more context dependent and contingent and is also a very small part of political organization in Afghanistan. And yet that then becomes almost synecdoche. So you talk about Fashtun and Wali and then you, talk, and you think, oh, that is all of Afghan social and political organization. Again, I guess comes back to the fact that this is largely a sort of minimalist endeavor in trying to understand Afghanistan and tribal becomes code word then being like, okay, this is how we think about Afghanistan. It's different, it's mysterious. Why is it mysterious? Oh, because it's tribal. Again, like kind of this sort of um, almost circular knowledge that gets produced about Afghanistan and tribal remains a code word. And you, you've seen, um, we've seen loads of stuff on tribal engagement, tribal uh, engagement teams were set up by the US, um, but also uh, lots of American sort of soldiers wrote about working with the tribes and then some of them turned out to be absolutely fabricated so there was no actual engagement but it was but just because you could say anything about Afga Afghanistan and about tribal work you could say oh this is how tribes work this is how we engage with them we had a success story and then you realize that that was not it at all or Greg Mortensen's three cups which also turned out to be based on complete lies about education in Afghanistan, right? So there are, if, when you probe, there's a lot of stuff that's just been basically made up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I think um, the the idea of the tribe also became very useful for a coterie of development scholars and experts as well. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Because because it became a tool for them to sort of touching the tribe, right? Interacting with the tribes, right? Uh, uh, implementing projects, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, became a way of uh, selling and reinforcing a, a particular development activity, which is working on the ground, right? Uh, uh, and so the tribe, it was sort of due to sort of the cursory or superficial engagement with 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 the actual people in places that we now call Afghanistan, the tribe began became a a useful, as you say, code became a useful um, uh, um, trope and a point of reference, a largely co-invented place, right? That that could be called real, right? If if you want to believe that I'm a real development expert, and if you want to believe that I'm doing some real development projects and making a difference on quote unquote the fetishized ground, right? The, the, the development and security experts obsessed with working on the ground, right? And being close to the people. Um, if you want to believe that I'm that I'm that guy or gal, you know, just look at you know how much I've worked with the tribe, right? And so, 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 so yes, the tribe becomes a useful tool in substantiating Afghanistan, right? And making it appear real, tangible, uh, uh, knowable, right? And, and so I, I really want to thank you for dedicating, you know, uh, so much of your book to, to it, right? Uh, because there's been obviously work at deconstructing the tribe as a, a colonial, political, uh, security, anthropological invention, right? And construction. Uh, uh, in Afghanistan, but, but but I think you do a beautiful job of condensing all of those those critiques and, and also obviously uh, uh, putting your own stink on it, if you will. Um, I, I think what, what Tribe does also relates to a question, a new question from, from Maria we have in, in the sense that um, a Tribe is also a racial tool in making Afghan, Afghans in Afghanistan knowable. Right? It has a has a racial over and undertones to it, and it's uh, uh, and it's deployed uh, to racialize Afghans, right? Mm -hmm. As as backward or as anti-democratic or as 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 incapable of, uh, of 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 good governance and whatnot. So speaking of race, then um, here's Maria's yeah. question: If I may expand our conversation a little to the other great pillar in your work, Nibi. The place of race and racism in international relations and international relations as a discipline. How do you see your critical study of representations of Afghanistan advancing a particular post-colonial pedagogy? How do you relate to the quote unquote decolonizing the curriculum agenda in the UK IR academia? Thank you, Maria, for this question, because this is obviously uh, something we talk about um, for all hosts of reasons, you know, a lot now. Yeah, um, that I think that's really uh, uh, an excellent question. Um, 
in terms of how I think about perhaps advancing the decolonizing the curriculum agenda, uh, there's some specific things um, in the book, the, you know, the, the, the sort of um, anecdotes or the artifacts I showed. The, they talk about pedagogy more explicitly. Of course, they're talking about school children rather than the university. But from the context I'm most familiar with, the UK, the school system is so anti-decolonial and anti-critical and anti-race thinking or anti-racist thinking, um, anti-anti that is, um, that a lot of the decolonizing the curriculum uh, it, that starts at the university is already too late. So there's, there's just, too much um, invested in a sort of exceptionalist narrative about Britain, about its island story, like Michael Gove called it, rather than about its colonial atrocities and just colony, colonization as a, as, a, as a thing that shaped Britain and also the world. Um, uh, there's very little on it. So I suppose one of the things that this does, uh, the book does is first uh, complicate some of the stories about colonialism and that ties into decolonizing the curriculum. The second thing it does is also perhaps expand the ambit of what we consider uh, decolonial or anti-colonial or post-colonial spaces. So again, when we think about decolonizing the curriculum, the curriculum that is decolonized is usually it's sort of the white male canon and then replaced by perhaps some 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 subaltern some thought, some thought from Fanon and from sort of um, the 50s and the 60s in Africa, but Afghanistan remains again, and places like Afghanistan, if you think about Yemen or Somalia, they still remain on the periphery of the decolonial ventures as well. So that so this does this, I hope, starts thinking about uh, what a decolonial agenda actually is at the university, what a curriculum that pays attention to the spaces that are not big, you know, so so it's a great powers in the West and then sort of great powers in the East. That's what it becomes. Think about China, think about India, but that doesn't take into account practices of knowledge production that seek to overturn the colonizing impulses. And I suppose that sort of thing um, comes from um, looking at places that aren't looking at not traditions of knowledge that aren't committed to just reproducing or rehashing those debates. Um, and I think, um, a lot of the times knowledge generation is uh, racialized implicitly. And so, and then race always as the R word or often becomes the sort of dirty word that we don't go near. We might talk about decolonizing uh, as, a, as a metaphor, very, very um, dis disjointed or divorced from the material realities of r the lived experiences of racialized subjects or minoritized subjects in the West. And I think thinking about race is important and and also connecting that to sort of um about as uh, connecting that to management right so it's not just the what happens in the classroom but the ways in which the neoliberal academy is organized um and that again it rests on knowledge and and the ways in which we think this should be best not we as academics but the managers who seem to run especially in the us and and increasingly in britain um so the decolonizing the curriculum then opens up to uh, to the to the the ways in which universities govern themselves, organize themselves, and it no longer is just a diversity initiative. There has to be more, um, and that can happen through a more expansive engagement with um, decolonial, postcolonial thought. That that itself sometimes is ghettoized, and you know the book kind of says that. So. Uh, that's quite a complicated and long-winded answer, but I hope it begins to, to answer your question, Maria. Yeah, th thanks. I, I think it had to be complicated and long-winded, and 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 just to um, maybe maybe substantiate a point. I actually pulled up a very interesting um, quote uh, by um, by Sean uh, uh, Grek about uh, uh, decolonizing uh, Eurocentric disability studies. And uh, this is really interesting because uh, uh, Greg talks about disabled bodies in the global south as neo-colonized bodies. And this is why um, decolonizing the curriculum is so complex. 
because he says what arrived in the Americas was not only labor and resource abstraction, but a wider power structure, a European capitalist, military, Christian, patriarchal, white, heterosexual, ableist male, establishing simultaneously in time and space several entangled global uh, um, hierarchies. So just That's wrapping, a quote. Yeah, wrapping your tongue around it, let alone your mind around it, is, is quite a bit of an exercise. And, and I think, especially for people like myself, you know, that, that sound a whole lot like this guy uh, that Greg describes, um, it, it, it sort of, it requires kind of pushing the boundary of, of, of lived experience in a way that is, that is, you know, not easy for ordinary people. You know, we, we teach, you know, 19, 20, I don't know, 20 something year olds, uh, how to both cope with their immediate experience and the immediacy of world politics that is exposed to them. We teach them that, and we also ask of them to, to critique it at the same time, right? To unlearn as they're learning, right? So, so this project is, 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 is uh, uh, extremely complex. Um, and, 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 and this is why, you know, one of the reasons why, why I love your book and why I love even in signing to my students readings that often seem detached from the disciplines they're supposedly being educated in, such as, you know, standard kind of boilerplate global governance and international organization. I like assigning these kinds of readings that flip the discourse on its head uh, uh, because it, it makes us think more critically about, wait, what is global? Who counts as global, right? And in many ways, the story of Afghanistan is a violent and, 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 and in many ways involvement in the globe that is often not on the done or, or never really done on the terms of the, the, the people who are being asked to participate in the globe, uh, um, but, but, but not fully, right? And not, not in their own uh, uh, way. So, 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 so thank you. Thank you for, 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 for um, writing in a way that makes um, your work speak to a whole lot of disciplines or sub-disciplines across international studies because it does help decolonize the curriculum, quite honestly. Um, and, and so, and maybe I want to kind of um, wrap up our, our conversation by really looking at, at some of these strategies of decolonization and critique and, and by shedding a little more light on, on the, the Three particular chapters in your book to talk about gender and masculinity, uh, um, and of of of, 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 well, of Afghanistan and of of, of, of Afghans. Um, so let me again um, pose the question on masculinity in particular and the queering of Afghans through a paradox that that just strikes me over and over again, which is, you know. How is it possible that Afghan men are both uh, 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 sort of these uber violent, uh, 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 savage-like, uh, 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 you know, uh, creatures who can bring empires to their knees? Uh, uh, um, and at the same time, these, I, I mean, th th there have been, in all seriousness, journalistic reports in, in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s that talked about the cannibalism uh, among the Taliban in, 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 in Afghanistan, right? They, they, they were seriously reporting on the cannibalization of people in, in Afghanistan, right? So how do we square that with the queering of Afghans, right? With these dismissals, the emasculation, the feminization as, as if these were you know, necessarily bad things, right? <laughs> of, of, of Afghans as, oh, Afghan men hold hands. Did you know that, right? Uh, um, they're quite effeminate. Did you know that? They have fair faces, right? And features, right? Did you know that, right? It, come, it comes from the knowing Afghan expert, right? How's that possible? Yeah, okay, again, another excellent question. Um, yeah, it's really funny you say that because some of the stuff I read and I think some of it made it in the book was all about US and British soldiers saying that they're really not scared about Afghan men, except when they come around mincing, get, making kissing noises, holding hands, and then they're petrified. So there's this like very macho, uh, homophobic discourse around these Afghan men. And then, of course, there's also the sort of warrior uh, discourse. I think apart from the sort of general things about 
the ways in which Afghanistan has been engaged with. I think there is um, a certain body of literature that talks about how terrorist bonds get formed in misogynistic places. So these men um, only only hang out with each other. They're co- it's almost like this lack of women hypothesis that because women are not available to these men, they then channel their masculinity as um, as sort of either queer sodomizers. So they basically start uh, having sex with each other, but they're not gay because homosexuality is not something that they understand. They're just animalistic or cannibalistic or whatever, or as um, they have this all this pent up rage, which comes from sort of sexual frustration and not being have, not having access to women, and therefore they go become suicide bombers or be, become warriors. I think a lot of this um, it, it's just a, like it's actually an academic sociological, not very good sociology, I would argue, but there is a sociological um, literature devoted to these kinds of sort of terrorist masculinities things, um, and. Um, so, so, and so that contradiction is in the literature and then is applied to Afghanistan. But I also think there is some deliberate or bad faith readings of Afghanistan. So I have some things on Thomas Dwarzak, who's a photographer who has a really good book called Taliban, which is basically a photography book that he goes and um, he goes around taking image, taking pictures of Taliban. And most of them, a lot of the men are wearing mascara or, um, you know, have lipstick on. And he was just trying to say, okay, you know, these, we think of these as really evil men, but they also have this kind of strange, slightly feminized side to them. And he actually tries, he tries to humanize them. But then that is instead picked up as this sort of perversity that not only are they these brutal fighters, they also have this like queer, dangerous... Um, side to them. And there's a art- great article by uh, Jasbir Puar and Amit Rai who talk about these sort of masculinities, these perverse masculinities. It's called uh, monster terrorist fag. And so there's like this, like the fact that these are men who are monsters, they're terrorists, but they're also fags is just a part of the discourse. They talk about Al-Qaeda perhaps a bit more than the Taliban, but that's that discourse already exists and and how that is perpetuated in a sort of heteronormative uh, way. And, and it, it, it also goes back to like representation. So uh, there's a chapter in the book uh, on women and then there's this w- woman, you know, the, the sort of vilification of the veil or the burqa is really a constant theme, but there's also a picture of a woman in a burqa holding a gun. And then that picture has then been repurposed uh, and shown in Australia in newspapers and also used by Britain first in the UK, which, uh, and then says, look, this is what happens when women in burqas walk around, they become, they can hide their weapons and they then go and go on a killing spree. That's the subtext. But actually the picture was of a police officer in, um, in um, Kabul. Uh, and it was taken by a Canadian photographer Lana Snezik and she wanted to show, I think her name was Malai Kakar, what Malai Kakar does in her different roles as police officer, as mother, as feminist. And um, again, she gets, she says, you know, this is absolute bullshit that that's been used to vilify her and to make her sound like a terrorist when she's actually going there protecting women and also just doing her job. And I, I mean, I'm not at all pro some state mandated veil policy, but the fact that that then allowed women to do their jobs as doctors, as police women, is completely sort of or navigate social spaces that they may not otherwise have access to is completely um, be, uh, elided, basically. And that happens with men as well, that they might just be wearing that not everything they do is n- automatically a terrorist perverse thing. You know, that's not to then say they didn't also do awful things. Some of these men have absolutely done awful things, not just to women, but also to other people. And, you know, so that that's those two things. The fact that they, that there can be nuance or that that stories can be complicated is just not possible when it comes to Afghanistan, because we don't have that much at stake or that we, we just don't have the knowledge and we just haven't dedicated those resources academically and otherwise. Right, right. Thank you. And thank you for um, sort of uh, 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 comprehensively gendering the, the, the question that I asked. 
Um, which then takes me to, to, I guess, the last question that I wanted to, I mean, I have so many more for you, but, 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 but just to be kind to everyone attending a call uh, on the, the, the presentation uh, and the talk. Uh, uh, one, one last question, which is really about, um, um, quote unquote, our kind, right? The self-avowed critical scholar and the way we uh, decolonize the global gaze on the sort of on Afghan women, right? Uh, in many ways, Afghan women are the paradigmatic subaltern, right? Uh, in, mm -hmm. in 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 uh, um, IR in academia, but also in the media and, and and just when it comes to everyday politics as well. Having said that, how do we? Um, how do we engage with the gender power relations uh, uh, um, that are not unique to Afghanistan, but maybe that may be taking place uh, in, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Mazari Sharif or Herat or, or, or Jalalabad. And, and so how do we engage with, um, with, with the, uh, the gender hierarchies and the exclusion of, of gendered bodies without fetishizing them as academics, without uh, uh, conveniently appropriating them, uh, uh, I think I'm getting at these aporia of critical scholarship, and uh, I, I, I often feel a, a bit, and, and then a lot of desperation when when I grapple with these questions, and 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 and, and it was kind of. I think my work is riddled with these contradictions. Um, so therefore uh, I do what we like to do. I just uh, hand the hot potato over to you. <laughs> that is a hot potato. Um, so I think in terms of Afghanistan, uh, like I said, the Afghan women often feel like they have been subject to a double whammy of local patriarchy and international sort of female nationalism. Um, one of the things that people on the ground, and so if it, for instance, if you take Rava, the Revolutionary Association for Women in Afghanistan, they say that instead of listening to feminist majority and having opera uh, performatively, you know, say the burqa has fallen and therefore Afghanistan's women, Afga Afghanistan women are liberated, listen to movements on the ground and there's loads of them and then try to pay attention to the, the, the sort of the needs for, the, the, the urgent needs of Afghan women. Of course, patriarchy is absolutely key, uh, but it manifests in different ways. Access to education, access to healthcare, the fact that so many um, women die in childbirth, the infant mortality rates, the fact that actually bombing Afghanistan is not doing anything for women. Uh, those also need to be paid attention to. So that's not to, to give at all a free pass to the Taliban, but to say that, um, that you know, those things are also happening and also to stop romanticizing the Western woman as this sort of absolute apex of what liberation looks like. You know, the, the female um, domestic abuse in the US or even in France is super high. There's many other ways in which queer, queer theory has shown that even if you have feminists, we still often work in, um, in heteronormative ways that propagate patriarchy that might be more subtle or might be different, but um, just to stop using that as the yardstick for progress. Um, and But also just pay attention to what's actually happening, I suppose, on the ground. Yes, yes, great, great, great. Yes, I think maybe this so combined uh, work of um, uh, pointing out both the discontinuity and the iterative nature of the gendering and gender hierarchies is the way to go in the sense that we show that the gendering of, 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 um, of the Afghan bodies is, is not something unique to Afghan politicians, to mm -hmm. Taliban, but in fact that the practices of gendering very similar at that uh, uh, are, are are reproduced elsewhere while also showing the unique sort of vulnerability of, uh, of, 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 of actual living women as opposed to the, the Afghan girl, right? The, 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 the infamous photo, right? Uh, uh, who is the face of suffering because Afghan is just so wretched. Uh, yeah. um, so, so, so I think that, but, but that work is really difficult, right? Showing both the continuity and the discontinuity is, 
it, 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 it leads to sort of compels very difficult writing, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Yeah, which which is why none of this is easy, by the way. <laughs> so 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 that's just just another reason why why I want to congratulate you. And I would I was just gonna say if anyone is interested in um the sort of paradoxical uh, disempowering effects of global gender empowerment in Afghanistan, uh, the work of Julie uh, Bio is fascinating, uh, uh, showing the sort of uh, whether it's intended or unintended doesn't matter, but shows the perversity of gender empowerment. Uh, 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 as practiced upon, upon Afghan Afghan women, um, and and so I think what you've done also also speaks beautiful beautifully to it. She does ethnography, but you have a great ethnographic attitude in in unpacking knowledge production, uh, and so so th th this type of work uh, kind of nicely dovetails uh, uh, with, with with some other sort of critical ethnographic stuff. So. If anyone needs, a, I think, a reason, I mean, there obviously you've shown over the past 90 minutes why uh, or so why this book is important, why people should read it, why they have so much to learn uh, from it and learn, you know, as much as really learn about how we've arrived at this imagination of Afghanistan, that we, the, 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 the idea that we think we know this place and these people. I think you've shown very well why this is an important book, but also I just want to say that uh, uh, you got your PhD in 2014 uh, and that your PhD uh, uh, dissertation titled Imagining Afghanistan was awarded the best PhD dissertation in the arts and social sciences by Claire Hall. And then this book uh, draws uh, a somewhat on it. Uh, I obviously haven't read the actual PhD, but, 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 but even just listening to you, how you would already change Things about this book, I can I can just imagine how how you know the, the journey it's traveled since since your PhD, but uh, the, the PhD did extremely well and and the book is uh, is already garnering a lot of attention. I want to thank you for giving us uh, 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 just over an hour of your of, of of your life of your of your brain power of of talking to us. Thank you for this um, fascinating conversation. I hope. Uh, um, everyone uh, uh, who attended really enjoyed it and can take away some lessons about decolonizing academia and, and curriculum and how we learn. Uh, um, so, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, I just want to invite everyone to join us uh, next week, um, uh, 3rd of February. Uh, uh, Kent's own uh, Philip Cunliffe will be presenting uh, and discussing his new book, uh, the new 20 years, uh, 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 the new 20 years crisis, a critique of international relations between 1999 and 2019. Again, at noon, uh, uh, same time, same place. Well, not quite the same time, uh, not quite the same place, but next week at noon. Uh, um, please join us for um, Philip's presentation. But now I, I again just want to thank uh, and maybe so much. Uh, um, thank you for contributing to the, uh, the intellectual life of BSAS. Thank and you so much for inviting me and for your absolutely generous and thoughtful engagement. You're, you're welcome. We'll, we, we should do it again. Uh, thanks so much, Nivi. Thanks, and uh, your, your, our door at BSAS is always open to you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you, Maria, for uh, uh, making this whole uh, book talk series possible for making uh, 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 for for framing it, uh, um, uh, explaining to everyone why it matters, and and for for uh, making it possible really at a very mechanical and logistical level as well as well as intellectually. Uh, thanks everyone, and thank you Tanya for helping us with uh, with with the um, with the discussion today and uh, 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 just making the the logistics work for Nivi and, and myself and for everyone who attended. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. All right.